Welcome back to another episode of Take Back Your Life Thursdays or Biohacking Your Pain. Today, we are privileged to have Dr. Carla Hightower with us today, and we're going to talk a little bit about food and nutrition, pain and diabetes, and how to be able to improve a number of different things going forward in our conversation today. Cutting Edge Pain Relief, the channel that teaches you how to biohack your pain and get back to doing what you love. Hello, I'm Dr. Orlando Landrum, and today I have with me Dr. Carla Hightower, who's going to talk a little bit about um, the elements of how to be able to deal with food and nutrition. And she's going to give you some insight about some of the things that she does and how to be able to help improve your overall health. This is Dr. Ha Dr. Carla Hightower. So, thank you so much Dr. for having me. Thank you so much for coming in. We really appreciate you coming today. And we know there's a number of things that you can kind of list to your accomplishments, but I'm going to embarrass you for just a little bit and really let our audience know about some of the things that are going on with you. So Dr. Carl Hightower is a physician, an MD, MBA, who is the founder of Living Health Works, which is a health coaching service. Um, she basically focuses on whole food and plant-based nutrition. She counsels clients and shows them how to really be able to prevent and reverse chronic disease, pain, and fatigue by changing what it is that they eat. She was inspired to shift her focus to food, and previously uh, she was a graduate of Northwestern University, both the medical school as well as their graduate school, and she attained a certificate in plant-based nutrition from the T. Colin Campbell Center for Nutrition Studies at Cornell. So she's been uh, putting together the, and has in place livinghealthworks.com, which uh, does both online course as well as coaching for how to be able to manage food and nutrition. And she has, this is her website right here, has a number of different offerings I think will be incredibly valuable to patients. But one of the things that we really want to kind of get into is kind of her origin stories and how it can benefit patients and what might be some of the things that we can really take away from all these kind of different discussions that are in play. So Dr. Carla Hightower, thank you for coming in. We really appreciate you being here. I know that a number of your patients have just raved about you online. They've talked about, you know, all the different things that you've done from being able to lower their blood sugar to reduce inflammation to facilitating weight loss to being able to um, lower cholesterol and reduce chronic symptoms and get people's energy back. So I just really want to kind of get some insight from you about a number of different things. And so I, I think I'd probably start off with right off the bat with what inspired you to switch from anesthesiology to kind of this focus on nutrition and health? Well, thank you, Dr. Landrum. I, I really had a personal journey that led me to be fascinated by the, the idea of plant-based because of what I did personally. And so that's where I started. 13 years ago, I was practicing traditionally as an anesthesiologist, as you know, and um, things were going great, it, and I enjoyed all the um, you know wonderful patients that we had throughout the different specialties: cardiac and OB and general and orthopedic. The wonderful patients that helped me really build a strong foundation in my career. But what started happening to me is that I patient too. I started having a lot of aches and pains. I was only in my my early forties. This just started breaking down for me personally. Um, I had low energy. I felt terrible most days when I woke up sluggish. I was still going to work, but but it was difficult because I was taking anti-inflammatory meds like a, a ton. I had acid reflux, abdominal pain, joint pain, back pain. 
And then I got to 2007 and I had pneumonia. I really difficult. It was very bad. It took me six months to really get. I was coughing like crazy. And I looked, I looked at the medications that I was taking, antibiotics, antibiotics. And then I started wondering, what's, what's going on? And I tested myself and found out I had prediabetes. And that was the wake-up call. I knew I had to do something different. My daughter was only 12, and I knew I couldn't get this sick and have a great future. And it would affect her. So that's when I went on my plant-based program. My mother had been telling me for years, she had been on a plant-based program for 40 years, since the 70s, and she had energy, she looked great, she reversed diabetes herself in the 70s, and I just knew I need to do what she's doing, and it worked. My pain went away, my one c my blood sugar went back down to normal, and um, I then all, all these men free, with normal blood sugar, no acid reflux, no digestive problems, no joint for 13 years. So I, I had to start teaching other people and I just gradually started teaching more people. People were asking me what I did and I was coaching people basically. And then when I was ready for a second career, I jumped in with both feet. Okay, very cool. Did you find it daunting at all initially to consider making that transition from having done anesthesiology for such a long period of time to then switching over to doing something like this? Yes, it, it really is. It's a big shift to, to make a change, to come out of the hospital setting and to go into something non-traditional. But the learning curve has been amazing because I took my skills as a physician and applied it, applied those skills of learning to this subject, which means let's go dive into the evidence. And the medical literature is basically what I use for this. I use that to, to boil it down. I take that information and make it easy for other people to understand. And I teach it in very simple, easy to follow terms. It's just fascinating to me. So it's a balance between, yes, it was daunting to make a change, but the trade-off is all the things that I've, that I've learned that have allowed me to, to share with more people in a way that keeps them out of the operating room. It's really meaningful to me to know that this valuable information can potentially help someone not be the patient that, that all the patients that I had who were having open heart surgery, for instance, or diabetic having to have those terrible procedures for um, amputation, for instance, or go on dialysis. If any of this valuable information, which has been, been proved so effective for people, can help one person like that, then it's all worth it. So I know that you commented on your ability to kind of delve into the medical literature so that there's a basis and this is not just fluff. What were some of the other skills that you took as a physician that helped you really be able to kind of uh, take this and help you be so successful? Well, for me as a physician, I feel like I've seen the outcome. I've seen what happens when we don't take care of ourselves. And I've also seen that the kind of the, those preventable um, outcomes. And so knowing what, what can happen and knowing these cases are largely preventable makes it a lot easier because I have the broad perspective of this right now. I feel like what they can do to heal themselves. And I know the path they're on. On. So when someone tells me how they're doing, some all night with neuropathy pain, for instance, afraid of taking medicine and how it makes them feel, I realize that um, I understand what that means. And so it's very helpful to have a perspective. Okay. So in you have a Facebook page too that has a community of individuals that really kind of live this life, don't you? What are some of the things that are kind of certain tenets of how they're able to give each other support and provide good value to being able to live this lifestyle? 
Yes, thank you. I have actually, I have a, a, a group of people in a program. It's a Facebook page called, a Facebook group called Natural Solutions for Diabetes. And that is a community where we really talk about the simple things that, that we can do. And it's, it's like you need a starting point. You need a stepping stone. And having that, um, having the ability to see that other people are going through the same thing are moving in the same direction, trying to make change, that's empowering because it lets someone know they're not a limit. Um, but the difference from just figuring things out on your own is that figuring things out on your own can be slow and not as effective. You can get answers when just Googling, but it usually can take you in a loop. It's better to have some guidance, have a, have a path for people who've gone before you can lay out a clear path and give you resources. So that that's really where I like for people to begin in, in, that, in that free Facebook group that I offer, which is it's open to people who are like-minded, ready to, to, to take some, some action and to improve their lives. What's the name of it again for us, Dr. Hightower? Natural Solutions for Diabetes. Okay, thank you. So towards that end, as we know, a number of diabetics have nerve pain. You know, that diabetic neuropathy that really is kind of classic for being in that stacking the glove type of distribution and being very prominent. One of the things that you have on that page, as in also in your web page, and I think maybe your blog, talks about foods for nerve pain. And I know our patients would love to hear more about that. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, so what I like to do is really make people aware that that there's a tremendous power that we have to heal ourselves. There's, we have tremendous built-in mechanisms for healing, and, and we are self-healing creatures. So um, I've observed this more so now as a health coach than I did practicing in the traditional setting, because our, our traditional approach to 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 um, chronic problems is often to write a prescription for something without, but there's the other side of this, which is what are the, what's the underlying root cause? What can we do with our, to see what's causing? And we know that in our, our Western culture, we eat a, a diet that tends to be high in inflammatory foods, that these foods that are, I certainly I grew up with and certainly the foods that I had been eating um, up until 13 years ago <laughs> really affect our, our, our cell function and can create kind of this chronic level of inflammation and make us more susceptible to have chronic pain. So, and I've seen it in my clients. For instance, there was a woman who came to me in her mid 60s. She, she was on 15 medicines Di, you know, medicines for diabetes and high blood pressure and heart problems, and also for pain. She was taking medicine for pain for her diabetic neuropathy. And I talked to her about some of the things that she had been eating, and I could see she was eating the traditional standard diet. And gradually, step by step, she made some changes, started eating more anti-inflammatory foods like leafy greens. We, um, she added some leafy greens more consistently, fresh fruits kind of laying off the processed sugars, <laughs> cutting back on those really high fat foods and shifting more to some whole plant-based foods like leafy greens, fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains, beans and lentils, these, and making meals that had more of those. And she gradually noticed that one of the changes was that her the pain in her legs started to go away, like noticeably. She started being able to sleep through the night and then she got to the point where the pain was just gone and she didn't have to take her, her pain medicine anymore. And so I've seen that in a number of people and it's just amazing. So Dr. Hightower, let me ask you a quick question. A lot of this comes from things to kind of jog our patients and our viewers' minds from the China study and also kind of that aspect of Forks Over Knives, which was that document documentary from 2011 that really talked about some of the differences in diet and how those things really kind of pan out. Can you comment on that a little bit for us, please? Oh, yes. And I think this is, this is really a great way for people to get started is to look at some of the documentaries that are 
evidence-based, forks over knives, really ties in the China study and that research that was done um, decades ago and really proved that we can make some significant, I would say simple, but powerful changes in our diet and nutrition and get these kinds of results that we can see the connection between what we're eating and how it affects our blood vessels, how it, how it changes our risk for chronic problems like diabetes, heart disease, and certain cancers are even connected to food. So I think that starting with a documentary like Forks Over Knives is a great idea. It's um, available on, on different platforms that you can watch and gives kind of a, just a beautiful overview where you see the stories of people who've made some, this, this change in the way that they're eating. And um, it's inspiring. And so I think it's a great place because we've got to see where we want to go. If you've never seen anyone make change, um, if you've never seen anyone reverse their heart disease, you may not think it's possible. But videos like that show you can, act, you can absolutely cut down that inflammation and start reducing some of these symptoms yourself without, without really anyone prescribing something that you can do a lot for yourself. Thank you. So again, in our Thursday sessions, really one of the things that we want to do is to take patients and give them insight on how they can empower themselves, how they can be able to kind of biohack their pain in essence. And just looking at your website, you got a number of those things that are happening. And I don't want to embarrass you, but you have one testimonial that talks about you took someone's blood sugar from 436 to 82 and their A1C went from 11.7 to 5.2. I think that that's phenomenal. It's not just about what we're seeing from the documentary, but actually being able to put it into implementation and actual practice. Can you talk about how that's impacted some patients' lives of yours? Yes, it's, this is the part that is so amazing to me because I'm seeing just in real life people changing and they're, they're, they're people who are out in the world and I work with and my, my clients over, over Zoom, you know, remotely. <laughs> so we, I see that they're not coming into a clinic or anything. They're just living their life and getting coached and learning. And it's a, it's a step-by-step -step change. And some of the changes are just phenomenal. The symptoms that they have are very tangible and very debilitating sometimes at the beginning. But they are able to, with their positive mindset, take some steps forward. So the change comes from them. I really want to reinforce that. This isn't me making, um, writing a prescription. This isn't me giving them medicine. This is them taking information and applying in small steps at first and then another step here and there. And what usually keeps them going is that they see the benefit to be able to see, oh, my blood sugar is no longer bumping up into the 300s and 400s. <laughs> and so, you know, we can, we can eat, we can wait, we can eat, we can eat a meal and not have that crazy spike afterwards. So, so it's, it's, it feels better. I think with diabetes in particular, what happens is when someone has it out of control, usually most people feel lousy, exhausted, very low energy when you have high blood sugar. And that is a vicious cycle keeping that can keep an individual from being able to make a change. So if you come home from work, well, right now we're already home. <laughs> a lot of people are already home, but, but not everybody's already home. We have, um, but we let's just say at the end of the day, someone is exhausted. You're not going to cook a meal. You're going to try to order something that may be unhealthy. It's, it's easier and faster to eat some processed food than it is to think about preparing fruits and vegetables initially. That can just seem so hard. But what happens is we break that cycle with one or two changes. It might be something just as simple as deciding to add a fresh salad. That could just be it. Like just a small thing like that seems so small, but if you do it again and you do it again, you're at, you, you will start to see some changes. Energy comes back and now you can make one more change. That might be something like I'm going to 
just clean up my back breakfast. Maybe I'll have some fresh berries on a consistent basis instead of a donut. <laughs> it seems like a small thing, but it's a powerful thing. So yes. Very cool. So what are some of the things that you would kind of classify as quote unquote superfoods? And the other question I'd ask, because I know I have some patients that are considering it, is so let's say they can't convert over to an entirely plant-based diet. Is Do they get any benefit by increasing the plant-based? And let's say that you kept some degree of animal products. How deleterious is it? And there are certain animal products that are probably more desirable than others. Can you give us any in insight about that? Mm -hmm. Not all of my clients actually go 100% plant-based. So because this is totally optional and you have free will, it's very different than when you go and get a doctor's order for something. This is not an option. So what I encourage people to do is to, is to take this as information and to, to start picking and choosing what works for you and then you can grow. So um, in terms of superfoods, I really love the concept of something green at every meal. And that is one thing that I teach that as a golden rule for my clients. Think about a way that you can have something green at every meal. It's simple to do. It's an easy to visualize concept. And you don't have to necessarily cook that thing that's green. <laughs> you might have a smoothie. You might have a, a salad. And there's so many greens that are um, that give you give us. I mean, that's the powerhouse, the leafy green, the top most nutritious and most valuable vegetable would be the leafy greens. So if people start there, that is the starting point. No hands down, that helps to unclog the blood vessels. And once you do that, you have better blood flow, you start thinking more clearly, you start having more energy, um, and one thing leads to, to the other. And then the other thing would be in terms of shifting to fruits, the top most nutritious, valuable fruit, which would, would be considered a superfood, would be the berries. Studies show that, that these food groups are powerful with, in terms of their nutritional value. So there are a lot of studies that are done on greens and, and blueberries, for instance, um, showing how we can decrease inflammation and start cutting down our risk for, for chronic problems quickly, actually. So to that end, I know that I have some of my own patients that are like, can you really be able to reverse atherosclerosis? They'd say cholesterol, kind of the fatty gunk that's present within the arteries and veins. How likely is that? Or do I really just going to have to accept that I'm going to need an angioplasty or surgery and that food's not going to cure all these type of things? Can you talk about that? What's the honest and scientific basis of some of the stuff you're saying? Yes. Um, so in terms of atherosclerosis, I, I love this question because we have a lot of myths in society about what really is causing it. And the biggest myth is that the atherosclerosis is um, it's not reversible because it's genetic and it's, you know, it's not reversible. You have it and you're stuck with it. You, it's your genes and it's your fate and it's old age, all of these things. We, we know are have been proven to not be correct because um, it, it's a lifestyle condition. It's not really a genetic, genes play a role, but not the biggest role. So what happens is we're, we're on a spectrum and the um, where we are on that spectrum will determine how much of it is reversible, but it's amazing how far along can be to get the benefits. And that those are the greatest stories. The, the, like you said in Forks Over Knives, that, that documentary. But those are the greatest stories because these are people who have advanced atherosclerosis. The original studies that were done um, by Dr. Dean Ornish and the original studies that were done by Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn in the Cleveland Clinic, those studies were on people who were at the end stage of heart disease. They were the ones who were too sick. Their heart disease was so bad, they wouldn't survive the surgery. So those were the first people who were put into these studies. And the case and the case reports were phenomenal. 
And we're talking, and these were done over 30 years ago, these studies, where they took the people who the surgeons, cardiac surgeons said, sorry, we can't help you. You, you just go home and sit and, and in a few weeks, you have a few more weeks to live, enjoy the time, go into a rocking chair and enjoy the time with your family. But they took those people and said, okay, this is your last ditch effort. We're going to put you on a plant-based diet. <laughs> and they put them on a plant-based diet and the people were motivated because what did they have to do, right? They didn't want to die in a month. So they did. And they started to, to reverse that angina, um, that chest pain started to lessen, started to be able to walk without the pain in their legs or without having shortness of breath. And, um, got better and better in terms of their symptoms and had more energy. And when they would go back to the doctor, there could be just amazing changes, um, angiogram level changes where they could visibly see, oh, the blockages are getting, are reversing. We're getting better blood flow in these areas of the heart. So, yeah. Wow, that's very cool. Tell me a little bit about a patient that changed your practice and touched your heart. Yeah. Well, I think the... I'll never forget a patient who, when I was practicing anesthesiology, actually, who had been, um, he was in his late 50s. He was um, fit and coming for open heart surgery. He looked amazing. He was, you know, toned. He was slim built. He was a runner. And he said, that he had been running and, and the reason why he be became a marathon runner was to stay out of the, to not have heart disease. And so when he had a heart attack and found all of his arteries were blocked, like severely blocked, and we were now going to do this open heart surgery for him, he was stunned and just, he kept saying, I can't stand why I'm here. And we looked at him and said, we can't understand why you're here either. <laughs> <laughs> but but the thing was was that was a time where i didn't understand that was in my early days i didn't know that it was his diet it was the diet that really was not just running and being and going to the gym and working out we have to have both physical activity that's great but we also have to have it's how we're eating we can't just run out out of our food we can't we can't outrun our diet that was the person and I did and it resonated with me. And when, once I started studying about plant based nutrition, I can circle all the way back to him. And he was probably he was he would have been my patient in the late. I remember he would have been in the early two 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 thousand. So maybe 20 years ago was, was this patient. And now I understand back then I didn't understand why he was there. And now I do. And it's just amazing to me how I can put this all together now. It's a full circle. Very cool. Very cool. So um, with all that being said, we know that there are certainly some myths about plant-based nutrition. So what would you say is probably one of the most common plant-based nutrition myths and how would you debunk it? Yes. The most common myth is that you can't get enough protein with a plant-based nutrition plan. Most people feel like, oh, where are you going to get your protein? And and the way that we were trained in medical school was that, oh, you need to get, you need to eat chicken at least and eat a lot of chicken to get protein. That's the, the old way of thinking, but that turns out to be a myth that if we eat enough food and we have a balanced diet, we can get not only enough protein, but we can get a higher quality quality and a safer type of protein. We're hearing all about the problems with meat and you know, right now during the pandemic. And it's just uncovering something that's been there all along that we there's a lot, there's a problem sometimes when we try to get our protein from meat and, and animal products. But if we have a balanced diet and we eat things like beans and lentils and a wide range of vegetables, and we get enough calories consistently, not skipping meals and not trying to drastically lose weight and um, starve ourselves, then we certainly have no problems getting enough protein. And there are many, uh, many athletes now who are plant-based and have, you know, they're able to tone up those muscles 
because they're they're getting plant-based protein that cuts down the inflammation and allows them to train better with less pain so they can go back and train again with shorter intervals and actually become um, strengthen their muscles even more effectively than when they were eating the animal products. Yeah, we have a number of different athletes like UFC fighters and a couple football players that are surprised, I think, anyone that they're doing a plant-based diet and are easily able to kind of debunk some of those same things that you kind of mentioned. So as we kind of go further and further into this, I guess for patients, what are some specific roadblocks for them to watch out for if they're really trying to at the very least dabble, but hopefully make this more of a lifestyle? What, what, where do you think are some of the challenges that are pretty consistent among different individuals? Oh, okay, awesome. I would say that, well, first of all, socially, this, is, this can be a challenge. And that's one of the things that I guide my clients through. And we talk a lot about how to be successful with a plant-based diet in, in your social life. And the key thing is to know that people are curious and people will ask, well, why are you eating this? Or why are you not eating that? And to be able to be centered and grounded in your goals and to know that um, you're, when you are interested in a plant-based approach to, your, to helping yourself stay healthy and well, that you have a bigger reason for doing it and it's not because we don't like, because we just want to reject um, <laughs> some certain standard food, but it's because there's another outcome. And to understand from a perspective of, this is a question someone asked me what I'm eating and why I'm eating it, they're curious to not really go on the defensive, but to be able to say, um, that's a normal question. It's a question that I would have had too. Um, so to just start taking that perspective down and, and not, and not taking, taking some of that pressure off and socially to start working in a community, to not be in isolation on your plant-based journey, to find like-minded people. And there we have a plethora of, um, groups like mine and also, um, plant-based meetup groups and conferences and events. That, abs that absolutely focus on this theme. So it shows you, oh, you're not alone in this. And you can go to places where you have this wonderful food and the social combination and starts to take the pressure off of people. So that would be the one thing that I would say stands out the most. And also eating out. I've been teaching people uh, some good strategies so that you can eat out I find that I can eat out almost everywhere because I use some strategies, um, you know, talking to the waiter about what I what I'm eating, and we peek. We can we can take parts of meals and put together side dishes and have a beautiful meal at most restaurants. Absolutely, with just a few little tweaks, it doesn't have to be. It's not impossible. It's entirely possible to continue to you know have that social life. So when we get back to in the restaurants. <laughs> which we're not going to right now. But when we do get back into the restaurants, those are the skills that that um, you know person has to have and, and needs some help with because those, those are obstacles. So having guidance, having a coach, or having um, anyone who's gone before you, it doesn't have to be a coach, but it can be anyone who knows what they're doing and that you see is successful, they kind of pave the way for you and it makes it so much easier. So. To that end, let me ask you, because right now when we're dealing with the pandemic, there you have some pluses and some minuses in the context of what you just mentioned, right? So we have some isolation, so you have less social judgment that you have to kind of defend from. But on the other hand, you also don't have the community that you normally would have to be able to be supportive. So in terms of online resources or ways that people could even start to implement this and now when they don't have kind of that social support, are there different manners and mechanisms about how they would be able to go about this in this current stage? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, well, I definitely try to keep my clients together 
that's why um, I, I think that this online platform, we want to make use of it. And so that's something that I focus on doing. I focus on keeping a community that's online and having it be a place to learn, to grow, and to try some new things and get feedback. So um, like for instance, if you, you are, you need a place basically, a, a place to ask questions, a place to, um, to try something new and different and get some, get some give and take over it. I, in my, for my clients, I do cooking demonstrations. We did one last night and that brought in that, that element of a social um, community. So we weren't physically together, but it has that vibe of we can talk to each other. They can see me cooking. I'm teaching, I taught them a recipe, a, a black bean. It was a stuffed, a chili stuffed um, sweet potato actually with black beans. And now I gave them the recipe and they can go and do it. So it's something that gives the flavor of connection. And we, we, we can certainly do that now, even though we have a pandemic. Very cool. So quick question for you. So you have a program that's called Optimal Health Reset, and it has different tiers that are kind of in place that really fill that online platform. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what might be useful? I think that going to your website, there's a couple free downloads that patients can kind of get their sort of like um, feet wet just a little bit. But then also, as I understand it, there's some type of, we're, we're catching it right on the last day of a program that is going to provide a heck of a whole lot of value to patients. And I want my patients to know all about it. So maybe you can kind of tell us a little bit about all those things. Oh, thank you. I'd be happy to. My program, Optimal Health Reset, we're, at, we're actually starting a new cohort um, it will start on, it will start, I'll be enrolling people starting next week and the, the cohort starts in June. So this is good timing. Optimal Health Reset is a group coaching program that really offers people the information, a chance to learn about plant-based nutrition in a positive environment with a goal of healing yourself. And I take people through what plant-based nutrition is, the root causes of the high blood sugar and insulin resistance, and just ways to start step-by-step step making some changes in, in the diet. And also we cover the key lifestyle changes like um, our physical activity and our sleep. We want to be able to start lowering some of the stress. So this, there are things other than food that really come into play, but we do focus on, on food making those changes in a way with some guidance that's that's really um that's really effective so you know i have some i call it the like the lifestyle formula and we've got some secrets to lowering your blood sugar so it's just things that allow this to be something you don't have to go fishing for the information for yourself basically <laughs> you can you can get support and it's an eight-week program it's all online um, there's a, the course material, cooking demonstrations, and then our wonderful Facebook group for people in that course. So that's that community that I was telling you about, um, the community that, that we had last night where we had the cooking demo. So, so that's what that's like. And um, the product that is on sale and ending today, that is my superfoods to boost the immune system. It's a mini course, I call it the, like a masterclass, a 30 minute video that walks you through some top foods that are connected to lowering the inflammation and um, you know, helping our cells and our immune system function at its best the way it should be functioning so that we're, we're not uh, suppressing it with some of our, our lifestyle choices. Okay. So I know one of your testimonies on your site talks about having had someone kind of get over the hump of taking too many medicines and feeling quote unquote old and unwell. And so by being able to kind of change the nutrition, can it really give you some of that sensation of being able to decrease your medication intake as well as being able to give you improved energy? Absolutely. 
I, I can start with myself. My journey 13 years ago be, began that way when I had that, that period of time. I, for about four years, I was just gradually taking more and more medications. And I wasn't taking anything for diabetes because I was in the pre-diabetes zone when I got, when I got my di diagnosis. But I was taking medicine for other things. Um, I was on several anti-inflammatory meds. I was taking numerous medicines, more than one proton pump inhibitor for <laughs> my acid reflux. And I had so one thing and, or, and or another that always seemed to have this recurring need to take antibiotics. So several times every year, I was on another course of antibiotics, whether it was my sinuses or um, uh, bronchitis, or in that case, pneumonia in two, 2007, 2008. I just had to look at that, all the prescriptions that I would go, my doctors would keep writing. Um, always a new prescription. And I was able to come off that. So in 13 years, I have not had to take any prescription drugs. And I haven't had those problems. I haven't had acid reflux, um, just amazing. Blood sugar came down. But for my clients who've been coming in with, with um, diabetes, taking insulin, for example, I have seen people come off of that insulin themselves by doing the work for themselves and just being able to demonstrate to their doctor as, and they always stay in touch with their doctor and keep that relationship strong because my role is as their coach, not as their doctor. So um, I advise my clients to really be communicative and to keep their doctor informed because that's one of the risks of this program is if you're not doing that, your blood, you're going to improve and your blood sugar and blood pressure are going to come down. And if you're still taking the same doses of medicine that you used to take when you were sicker, you are now effectively overdosing yourself and we must avoid that. So as you improve, the key is to have your doctor work with you, take you off the medicines that you don't, that you don't need anymore. And it's a phenomenal feeling, saving money. I, I have people who used to take $600 worth of medication a month with good insurance. <laughs> like crazy, right? With their good insurance from their employer, they still had to pay that because as we know, insulin is not cheap. And um, for them to be able to pocket that money for their, for their future, for their family, for their retirement, that is huge. So yeah, I've seen, I've seen some things that just are mind blowing to me and it's amazing. Keeps me going, keeps me wanting to do this every day. So what are some of the things that you are most curious about right now in the realms of nutrition and health and how might that be able to benefit patients going forward? I am most curious about really what individuals can do with very simple changes. And um, I see what I love is the fact that we have so much research now. We have research in terms of more than just the common diseases. We have research going on in terms of you know how does food affect the immune system? So it might be obvious to think, well, how does food affect you if you have diabetes? But let's talk about, we can talk about the immune system. Um, that's top of mind right now. And I think that the a lot of times our research institutions are looking to create a molecule or they're looking to take a fresh fruit or vegetable that has been shown to be powerful, let's say blueberries, for instance, is a good example, and to take that and try to convert it into a medication. But what I'm always curious, I'm, so I'm following those kinds of studies because as they start to get ramped up and you'll see the number of studies just increasing, I'm like, okay, that is something, that's a food group. Let's not wait until they turn it into a medication. <laughs> Let's eat more of that. Mushrooms would be another one. So many studies on what mushrooms are doing for the immune system, improving a person's immune system. And the scientists are hoping that they can figure out how to make it into a medication, um, medicinal mushroom or something. But no, 
that should be our clue. I'm curious about why why we can't eat more of that. <laughs> Definitely. So if you could step into my shoes and ask you something that I missed, what would you ask? If I were to step your shoes and ask you, oh, something, okay, I got it now. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit <laughs> convoluted, but yeah, what did I miss asking you? Uh, I would say, um, I would say, what's next? That would be a great question. What What's the next thing? And so for me, the next thing is to, is to grow my my reach to be able to help more people help more people in the way that um that they are able to to blossom to grow and to thrive so so that's my journey right now i shifted from being in a, a physical location and this whole year i have been online and i am really excited about this platform of being able to reach people online I've been exclusively in the online platform. And so that's really what's next is for me to use more of these types of vehicles, like what you're doing right now, this kind of interview setting, um, and to be able to create programs that people need in their lives and can use very simply and very easily. So um, I'm growing this program that helps people lower their blood sugar, which is really exciting and um, making some things that are really accessible. To, doesn't have to be a huge commitment, like the masterclass that just took off and it became a really uh, well-received thing for, for someone in 30 minutes to be able to get a nice chunk of a really quick video and uh, that goes deep, but in 30 minutes and you walk away with something that's inspiring to you. So it's that kind of thing that I'm interested in really sharing more of and allowing it to be accessible and bite-sized even for more people to experience. Okay. So I think this really feeds well into the, this question, which is if you could be able to have this discussion three years from today, and you look back on those three years, what would have had to happen both professionally as well as personally for you to feel like that you're happy about the progress that took place? Well, three years from now, what I really want to do, what I want to start seeing, I would love for to be able to see more of this concept be considered mainstream. It's gradually happening but we have a long way to go. So professionally, I want in three years for a, someone who's my client to be able to walk into their any of any office visit that they have and share with their doctor what they're doing and then be able to um, go to any other kind of practitioner and not and have it be common knowledge basically rather than to to to, to be something that's just um, new for so many people. I want this to, to be an empowering tool that's now mainstream, that our diet and our nutrition is what we are going to, to be incorporating on every level, every type of care that we get. So when you whether you go to your primary care doctor, um, it's not just something that's, you just check the box and say, oh, you're eating okay, that you know it's something that really is interwoven into other aspects. So we have a complete picture and um, that will facilitate for people being able to use it long-term and not have to uh, find so many roadblocks out there. So that would be the, the thing, I wanna see that. And then personally, I really want to be able to just really continue what I'm doing. I love, I have the energy, I want to, I'll be 60 in three years. So I want to be able to celebrate that with good health that I've enjoyed for the past 13 years. Um, I want to be able to continue to be that role model for other people that 
they can turn their health around. I want to continue inspiring people by, by staying on that journey and reaching new heights, you know, getting even more fit, uh, getting, um, getting a, you know, just, just keeping that energy going and being, that will make me very happy. I hope all those things come to pass. Let me ask you, so I know this is going to be a little controversial, so, but I, our, our viewers like it. So <clears throat> why do you think, or why do you know, probably is a better way of phrasing this, that traditional medical society just really hasn't embraced it all that much? And it's been going on easily where 10 years ago, almost 10 years or so ago, this documentary came out and you had major physicians, a biochemist and an MD from Cleveland Clinic and from Cornell, which are not, you know, un... Uh, tenable uh, places of knowledge that are pretty well renowned that it hasn't been more embraced by the community as a whole. Okay, this is great because the, the reason that I believe that it hasn't been embraced is because we have a very deep and entrenched system of medical education. So our traditional medical education is very steeped in approaching our problems that are emergencies or um, crisis management issues first. But that is the centerpiece of our of our approach in traditional medicine. So when we went to medical school, we weren't so much focused on how can someone stay healthy. We weren't really focused on that with our training. We weren't focused up. We weren't. We weren't focused on how you can eat to decrease your risk for pain and diabetes or high blood pressure and heart disease. We were focused on how do you treat that when someone comes in to the emergency room with crushing chest pain? <laughs> how do you treat that person who's got excruciating pain and is debilitated? How do you treat someone who has a blood sugar of five hundred? You so, and because those are those are crises, right? So we were we have and we we became masters of managing those emergencies and crisis situations, which pe and people need that. There's no doubt about it. If you've got a if you come in with crushing some sort of pain that's ten out of ten, you probably cannot sit down and eat a bowl of broccoli for that. You probably do, do need to get yourself in to your doctor and get treated immediately for what I diagnosed and treated. So same thing, heart attacks, strokes, all these crises. And we became experts over the years. So we've got the, the, this history of being able to manage something that people cannot manage on their own. And that's the toolbox, the medicines, the surgery. But then that made us more like firefighters in my view, where when your house is on fire, you're going to call and the, they are going to come. And oh my goodness, they're, they're, they're basically there to save your life. They're going to, they can save your home. They can save your family. And it's amazing what they do. And that they don't, that the fire department waits for the fire. And that's what they're trained to do. They, they're not trained to spread themselves out. First, they don't have the resources to do it to go from house to house, making sure your fire, your smoke detectors working, your car, your CO2 detectors working, your, um, your, uh, you don't have flammable stuff. You have good safety habits. You're, you're going to prevent a fire and you have good wiring. <laughs> they aren't going to do any of that, but then that's how medicine is too. It's a totally different system that has to change and be in place. And right now the system couldn't possibly with this, with a low number, of we have a shortage of doctors and nurses and so to do preventative care is a whole different system and we just don't have it and we weren't given those tools okay well, thank you so much for joining us today where can our listeners find you online and also where to be able to get more information to connect in and hopefully be able to actually avail themselves of some of the programs that you have available Oh, I can be reached at my website, which is livinghealthworks.com. And you can go to the website, 
there's a place where you can contact me. You can send me an email through the through the website as well. And I would love to connect. Um, I do offer 15 minute free discovery calls. So there are all sorts of ways that people can connect with me um, and find out more. Okay. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Hightower. We really appreciate you giving our, uh, your attention and explanations to our viewers about how they can be able to take control of their lives and be able to deal with their pain and other ailments that afflict them by using nutrition and really putting the autonomy upon themselves to be able to help take care of conditions that we previously thought only had to be treated by medications. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Dr. Landrum. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you and your, your wonderful listeners.